St. Alphonsus de Liguri teaches not to be moved to tears after seriously considering the passion of our Lord is a sign of coldness and lack of devotion. Seems like a frightening thought that not to be moved to tears after seriously considering our Lord's passion is a sign of lack of devotion and lukewarmness. Indeed, the saints, St. Ignatius, every time he offered Holy Mass, his eyes were filled with tears. Many other saints, they were filled with great tears on contemplating our Lord's Passion. Cardinal Newman offers a beautiful meditation, which I'm going to adapt slightly, which I have found to be very helpful in stirring up tears, in getting to the core of the mystery of the passion and really, really touching my heart. It was a sermon that Cardinal Newman writes on the subjects of feelings, the feelings we should have stirring up within us when we contemplate the passion of Christ. This is how he begins the sermon, talking to a, a group of middle-class Anglicans in Victorian England. He writes, Unless we have a true love of Christ, we are not his true disciples, and we cannot love him unless we have heartfelt gratitude to him. And we cannot duly feel gratitude unless we feel keenly what he suffered for us. I say it seems to us impossible under the circumstances of the case, that anyone can have attained to the love of Christ who feels no distress, no misery at the thought of his bitter pains, and no self-reproach at having, through his own sins, taken part in causing our Lord's misery. The saintly cardinal then tries to help stir up within his congregation a little more what they should feel when they are presented with the sacrifice of Christ, the tender feelings that his sacrifice should bring about within them. And so today I'm going to follow the Cardinal's train of thoughts. From this point on, I'm going to follow the structure of Cardinal Newman's meditation for our benefit. I'll use quite a lot of his words, but also mixing in some of my own, where I feel that our present day language is perhaps more understandable. We begin our meditation. Consider the text. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus is described as a lamb, and so he was, defenceless, innocent. The Bible compares Jesus to an inoffensive and unprotected animal. This is then an image we can think about to help stir up true feelings for our Lord. Let us think about how cruelly God's little creatures are treated. I read recently about a horrific case in South London of a twisted individual who was going around and stealing cats and then afterwards subjecting them to the most terrible of tortures. Some had all their fur shaved off. Others were strangled. A number were stabbed repeatedly. Many were decapitated. We can imagine that some of these little animals probably approached the killer willingly. 
Maybe they purred by his legs. Maybe they meowed softly as he picked them up and held them. They did not know what horrible plans he had for them. Isn't it horrible to picture a poor little kitten fastened against a wall, pierced, gashed and so left to linger out its life, left for passers-by to look at, to discover, exposed and lifeless. I'm not using these distressing words without reason, my friends. This was the very same kind of cruelty inflicted upon our Lord. He was gashed with the scourge, pierced through hands and feet, and so fastened to the cross and there left, and that as a spectacle. What is it that moves our hearts when we think of these poor cats? Firstly, it is the fact that they had done no harm. They were just minding their own business. Then there is a fact that they have so little power of resistance. And third, the cowardice of the man attacking them who is so vastly stronger than they. If we read a story of a fierce lion being cruelly put to death, we might feel moved, but not as much so, because lions are quite able to defend themselves. There is something so very dreadful, so satanic, in tormenting a little one who has never harmed us, who cannot defend itself, who is utterly in our power and has no way of attacking. Think now that this was the situation of our Saviour. He had laid aside his glory. He had, as it were, disbanded his legions of angels. He came to earth without weapons, in utter helplessness, as the Lamb of God. Whenever you are moved by the treatment of innocent animals, let it move you to weep the more over the treatment of our blessed Lord, who made himself more vulnerable, and after having only ever offered love and mercy and kindness, after this he received the treatment beyond even the desert of the greatest evildoer. Point two. Let us look at another example, one even more overpowering. We do not even have to see cruelties done to little children in order to be moved. We only need to hear a short description and we are filled with sorrow and anger and disgust. Only, again, this is for the same two reasons. The child is innocent, and the child cannot defend itself. I'm not going to go into details of this kind of cruelty, but here is just one thought, which I will be very brief about. What if a group of wicked men went into a nursery school and grabbed a little toddler, perhaps three years old, and then, taking it outside, stretched out its tiny arms, its small limbs, and nailed them to a cross of wood, and then afterwards, taking its feet, drove a stake through them, so the child was fully crucified and left to die. Probably my words are too shocking. They are very shocking. We all feel a horror about this, especially when we imagine one of our own children or grandchildren or nieces 
or nephews. To imagine it further. To give further description. Would be too painful. Before long. Every one of us. Would be weeping. My friends. We feel horror at this. And yet. Many of us can read of the sufferings of Christ with indifference. Was not Jesus innocent? Indeed, was he not gentler, sweeter, meeker, more tender, more loving than any little child? Let us be shocked at his sufferings, the sufferings of our innocent, defenceless Saviour. Now, to add a third thought to our analogy. Our Lord was not just innocent and defenceless. He was also venerable. He was good. He performed so many acts of kindness, of complete selflessness. Let us imagine an older person now, someone we have known as long as we can remember, someone who taught us, gave us good advice, encouraged us, smiled on us, comforted us in trouble, someone whom we knew to be very good and religious, someone just waiting to be called by God almost to go straight to heaven. Now picture that person whose memory is so dear to you. See that individual rudely seized by fierce men, stripped absolutely naked in public, insulted, driven about here and there, made a laughing stock, struck, spat upon, dressed up in other clothes as ridicule, then severely scourged on the back, laden with some heavy load till it could no longer be carried, pulled and dragged about, and at last exposed of all wounds to the gaze of a rude multitude who came and jeered. What would your feelings be then? Think how emotionally overwhelming that sight would be. My friends, what is all this to the suffering of our loving Lord, which so often we read of as a matter of course? Now think of him in his wounded state. Consider him dying hour after hour bleeding to death and how in peace no with arms stretched out and his face exposed to view with mockers passing by as his life gradually ebbed away O oh lord let us feel some of that sword which pierced your mother's heart as we think of you as we kneel before your cross through this meditation. But now, one last, one final and most shocking point in our analogy. The one who committed this great atrocity, this unspeakable outrage against one and as innocent as a child, as meek as a tiny, helpless creature, as good and wise and venerable as our dearest of guides through this journey of life. That evil doer was not just them. It was me too. I was among them. I took my part. If I had sinned less, 
he would have suffered less. There would have been a smaller debt for him to pay, fewer sins for him to atone for, to apologise for with every fibre of his being. I see his sacrifice on the cross. Here, Jesus takes away those sins of mine. He makes himself the victim of my sins. Before God the Father, Jesus stands as my representative. Every strike of the whip, he offers an act of apology and sorrow. In every blow, he glances up to the Father and cries, Forgive her. Forgive him. In love and in sorrow, Jesus atones for my sins. If you want to know, then, why Magdalene wept so much at our Lord's feet, what brought about those tears of repentance, it was surely some kind of realisation that her sins had offended our Lord, that they were linked to his suffering, his death, his agony, his burial. Our Lord says himself, as she pours the oil upon his feet and head, she has done well, because she has anointed me for my burial. True repentance, sorrow from the heart, is not out of fear of hell, or out of shame, or regret that you have been found out, deepest kind of repentance starts with a contemplation of our Lord's passion, the result of my sins. May the sight of this break my heart. May it cause me to want to break definitively once and for all with all evil elements in my personality, in my habits, in my life. O Lord Jesus, most innocent one, most gentle one, most meek, most venerable, I see in you an image of those I find most venerable, most meek, most gentle. I see you are far meeker, far more gentle, more venerable than any one of them. And I see myself, and my sins, as instigating the barbarous torture O oh Lord, it is I. Forgive me. Blessed Mother, intercede for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.